Low back pain can be caused by a myriad of different etiologies, and consequently the examination can take on a variety of different forms. The approach that will be discussed here is best applied when the history is suggestive of a musculoskeletal etiology. If you suspect the visceral or vascular origin of the pain, then an altogether different exam will be required. The purpose of this video is to guide you on how to do a focused lower back exam. This is not a combination of all back exam techniques, which would be very time consuming and cumbersome. Instead, the aim is to verify findings that have been discovered in the history and to adequately screen for red flags without rushing yourself or the patient. Pending findings discovered in the history, a more detailed examination may be indicated, requiring that you tailor your strategy for each patient. But for the most part, a straightforward screening exam will suffice. You may wish to begin with a simple introduction, introducing yourself and getting to know the patient. There are many ways in which you can do this, from brief and simple greetings to more elaborate introductions. Next, you require consent from the patient in order to perform the examination. Inform them of your intentions, what you will be doing, and let the patient know that they may stop you at any moment. Now is also an opportune moment to wash or sanitize your hands if you've not done so already and to ensure that the patient is properly positioned and draped. The entire back should be exposed for complete inspection. Now would be a good point to obtain the vital signs. But if you're taking an OSC exam, you might actually have to ask for them, in which case this would be a good moment to do so. Now on to inspection. Tell the patient you will first need to observe them for a moment. As you are doing so, note the patient's level of comfort and any signs of distress. Is the patient standing or moving around, opposed to sitting calmly? How is their posture? Does it appear ontologic? Think about how their body habitus might affect their joints and mobility. Also make note of any accessory equipment such as a walking aid. Depending on the type of exam that you have, you may need to vocalize the observations during this exam, particularly if you take it online. Next, I suggest to hold out your hand and then ask the patient to stand up while offering help in doing so. Observe for any pain, discomfort, or difficulty in raising from the seated position. Continue with inspection from the back and then from the side. On the back, inspect for any swelling, discolorations or scars, hairy patches, deformities, asymmetry, or muscular atrophy. While inspecting from the side, assess the contour of the back, noting any significant deviation from the normal spinal curvature, such as excessive thoracic kyphosis or the lack of lumbar lordosis, that is, flattening of the lumbar spine. Now examine the patient's gait. Ask them to walk to the end of the room and back. Pay attention to the gait cycle, range of movement, and turning ability. Make note of any difficulties that the patient has and any specific gait abnormalities displayed. It's not always necessary to test heel and toe walking, but significant weakness of the muscles innervated by L4 to L5 can be screened for with heel walking, while toe walking screens for significant muscle weakness in the S1 distribution. If you detect the Trendelenburg gait, then you may wish to elicit the Trendelenburg sign. To do so, stand behind the patient and place your hands on their iliac crests. Then ask the patient to stand on one foot at a time. Normally, the iliac crests will remain level, but with hip adductor weakness, there will be a drop on the side of the non-weight bearing hip. The Trendelenburg sign indicates dysfunction of the hip adductors, which can be due to superior gluteal nerve damage or an L5 radiculopathy. Next comes palpation. While observing the patient's face, Palpate the bony prominences of the spinous processes along the midline of the spine. Feel for step-offs and other gross deformities, and watch for facial grimacing as a sign of tenderness. For reference, the L4 to L5 intervertebral space usually occurs at the level of the intercrystal line, which is an imaginary line that connects the superior aspect of the iliac crest posteriorly. Next, palpate lateral to the midline to assess the paraspinal muscles for tenderness, muscle spasm, asymmetry, and other deformity. Lastly, press on the sacroiliac joints. If possible, assess active flexion and extension of the back. While assessing range of motion, position yourself close enough to the patient in order to provide support if necessary. During back extension, you may offer to place your hand on the patient's lower back in order to help keep them steady. Pay particular attention to if the pain is worse with flexion and improves with extension, and vice versa. Make note of any restrictions in movement as well as the fluidity to which the patient manages these movements. If you suspect an inflammatory spinal disorder, then it may be prudent to perform a Schober test and to assess for chest expansion. 
To perform a Schober test, mark two points on the back, one midway between the posterior superior iliac spines and the other 10 cm above it. Ask the patient to bend forward and then measure the distance between these two points. Normally, the distance should lengthen by at least 5 cm. An increase of less than 5 cm indicates restricted lumbar spine range of motion and is suggestive of an inflammatory spondyloarthropathy, such as ankylosing spondylitis, but it can also occur with chronic back pain and spinal tumors. An alternative form of this test, the modified sober test, may be preferred. Next up is a contracted neurologic exam with a focus on the function of the L4 to S1 nerve roots, which are the areas most often involved in mechanical low back pain. Extensive neurologic evaluation is usually unnecessary. If you suspect mechanical back pain, then one test per nerve root is sufficient for screening purposes. However, if an abnormality is found, then further examination is warranted. For the purpose of this video, I will discuss sensory, motor, and reflex screening tests for each of the relevant nerve roots. For the sensory screen, dab the patient's skin with a piece of cotton wool to detect any loss of sensation. Assess three dermatomes, starting distally and moving proximally. The lateral aspect of the foot corresponds to S1, the web space between the first and second toe corresponds to L5, and the medial malleolus corresponds to L4. Saddle anesthesia, as well as bowel and bladder incontinence, are important sides of Conno Aquina syndrome, which is a surgical emergency. To assess for perennial sensation, which is supplied by the sacral roots 2-4, to four, lightly stroke between the upper buttocks with a blunt object. This assessment can be formed now or at the end of the examination, whichever you prefer. In terms of motor function, instead of examining the strength of all the muscles of the lower legs, nerve root dysfunction can be screened for by assessing three active movements against resistance. Knee extension tests for L4 function, toe extension tests for L5, and toe flexion tests S1. If you detect any weakness, then assess motor function on other movements corresponding to the same nerve root. And remember, always compare both sides. Prior to assessing the reflexes, it is helpful to first palpate the tendon. And if the reflex is not initially obtained, attempt a reinforcement maneuver. For example, you may ask the patient to hook their hands together and then pull, at which point you should strike the tendon. The ankle reflex tests the S1 nerve root, while the knee reflex mostly tests L4. To assess the plantar response, stroke the patient's foot with a blunt but narrow object. Run it from the lateral edge of the heel to the tuberosity of the fifth toe, and then immediately across the forefoot. Normally, all toes will flex, that is, curl downwards. However, extension of the great toe, known as Babinski sign, is indicative of an upper motor neuron lesion. This finding is highly significant and would negate an isolated diagnosis of mechanical back pain. Provocative tests can increase suspicion of a particular pathology. The straight leg raise, for example, can reveal irritation of nerve roots L5 and S1, while the femoral stretch tests put stress on the L2 to L4 nerve roots. Another test that can be performed when there's suspicion of hypothology is the Faber test. To perform the straight leg raise, have the patient lie supine with the contralateral leg flexed to about 90 degrees in order to reduce hamstring tightness. Then slowly elevate the ipsilateral leg with the knee in extension. The test is positive if the patient reports leg dominant pain in the distribution of radicular nerve roots. Reproduction of the patient's typical back pain is not relevant for the sake of this test, so it is very important to clarify with the patient where it is that they felt pain. If there is uncertainty, sensitizing maneuvers such as foot dorsiflexion or neck flexion, can help support the finding of nerve root irritation. Also perform the straight leg raise on the other leg. Reproduction of pain on the contralateral side, a maneuver referred to as the cross straight leg raise, further supports suspicion of nerve root irritation. Alternatively, a modified straight leg raise can also be very useful. In this version of the test, the patient's leg is elevated while in the seated position, thus stretching the nerve root. Reproduction of radicular pain can cause the patient to lean backwards in order to relieve nerve root tension and to place both arms on the table for support, a position referred to as the tripod sign. Failure to lean backward or elicit pain experienced on the straight leg raise would be suggestive of non-organic pain and could raise concern of malingering. And this brings us to the end. 
When you finish your exam, remember to thank the patient for their cooperation. I hope you found this lecture to be helpful and worth your time. Please feel free and very welcome to leave a comment or suggestion below. And if you like this video, please hit subscribe and check out some of the other videos in this channel.